Hi, and welcome to the FlowSOM tutorial in Cytobank. My name is Jeff Cracker, and I'm an application scientist at Cytobank. So why use a high-dimensional analysis approach? There are many cytometers now that allow you to look at 10 or more colors, and when you're looking at that much data, it can be difficult to kind of wrap your head around all of the different channels at once. Here we can see a diagram of each parameter in this panel versus all the other parameters. And it's, a, again, a lot of data to wrap your head around. And so using machine learning algorithms can help see all the differences between your populations uh, much more effectively. Here's an example of that. Sharam Kardosti and his group at King's College in London used Visni to help them look at complex data. On the left here, we can see healthy donors. All of the gray dots are T cells, and the colored dots are the Treg cells. So in the healthy donors, all of the Tregs localize to this B region. Uh, and this is uh, essentially indicated they have the same phenotype. When they looked at the Tregs from the immunosuppressive non-responders, they saw that most of the Tregs occupied this A region, which means they have a slightly different phenotype than the B region. And then for their immunosuppressive responders, uh, it looks like, again, the, the phenotype is a little bit split. There's more of a B phenotype. So the people that responded to the therapy had Tregs that looked more like healthy people's Tregs. These changes were very, very small, uh, and essentially using Visni helped the authors to determine that this was going on, where otherwise just looking two parameters at a time would have been difficult. I like to think about high parameter data uh, as an object, just like a globe is a multi-dimensional object. Here you can see, to, to really understand what's going on on the surface of a globe, you have to rotate it. And the same is true with your data. To see what's going on in your data, you have to rotate through all of the different channels to really understand what's going on. These machine learning algorithms can help with that by taking your data and reducing the dimensions, just like a globe uh, reduces the dimensions down to a map. And there's several different kinds of map projections. Some are easier to understand, some are more technically accurate. Uh, the same is true with these tools that we'll be talking about, specifically today, FlowSOM. So there's different ways to, to reduce the dimensionality of your data. Uh, and like I said, today we'll be talking about FlowSOM in particular. So if you're unfamiliar with Cytobank, we'll back up here just a second. Uh, Cytobank is a web-based cytometry and other data type analysis platform. We have these high dimensional analysis tools, things like Spade, Visni, Citrus, and FlowSOM. We also have structured content management. These are tools that help you organize, archive, and collaborate uh, with your data once it's on uh, your Cytobank account. In addition, we also have an informatics consulting group at Cytobank. This is a group of us that actually also analyzes customer data. So uh, instead of just providing tools, this group will actually do the analysis um, in kind of uh, large projects. Uh, this is an option. Uh, if this is something you might be interested in, uh, let us know and we can uh, start a conversation. However, today I'll be mostly talking about FlowSum. In case you're unfamiliar with the other tools that Cytobank offers, just very briefly, we have all the basics that you'd expect for cytometry analysis, uh, histograms, dot plots, gating, automatic compensation. We have the other algorithms that I've mentioned, Spade, Visni, Citrus, uh, and FlowSum, which we'll be covering today, and also a few other tools to help you present or uh, analyze your data. Um, these are things like heat maps, uh, ways to work with plate-based uh, samples, a way to export stats, an API to help you interact with Cytobank computationally via the command line, if that's something you're interested in, uh, and also Drop, which allows you to look at other data types like single-cell RNA-seq or segmented image files, nanostring, or Luminex data um, in these algorithms as well. However, today, like I mentioned, we're going to be focused just on FlowSOM and how to use it inside Cytobank. So if you haven't read the paper, I'd recommend it. Uh, it is basically describing how FlowSOM works. So FlowSum, uh, just in a couple highlights, uh, is a clustering algorithm. So it's similar uh, in principle to Spade. However, it has uh, a few key differences. Uh, the first one is that it uses self-organizing maps. Uh, and, and effectively, that gives you a way to reproducibly map the same cells to the same locations on your tree. So uh, this is one uh, big uh, benefit. Uh, over a spade is that it can be very reproducible with the self-organizing maps, and also you can set the seed. 
uh, and I'll talk about what that means in just a little bit, but it allows you to get very reproducible analyses from, uh, from FlowSum. Another big benefit is that it is very, very fast. Um, it is uh, much faster than Spade is, and again, we'll talk about this in a little bit. And lastly, it allows you to cluster and then meta-cluster. So you can take similar cells and put them into clusters, and then similar clusters and put them into meta-clusters. And this mirrors, in my opinion, uh, biology much better. Instead of breaking your data apart into 200 clusters, you can have 200 clusters and then uh, 10 or 15 or however many you select meta-clusters that much more accurately um, uh, break apart the data into subpopulations similar to what uh, a person would gate. So, like I said, uh, first up, um, you can run multiple flow sum analyses in parallel on the cloud. Uh, this is a benefit of running it in Cytobank. You can, again, use our servers to run the calculations. None of the calculations happen on your own computer. This allows you to run up to 90 million events uh, with an upgraded compute on your server. You don't need to split the studies uh, that you're doing into smaller subsets or to subsample the data. You can look at, again, all of, uh, essentially, your events in one analysis. The self-organizing map is persistent, so you can add new data into the experiment and the tree will retain its shape. Uh, and then lastly, you have this generated flow sum experiment with these meta clusters that you can then interact with in the gating page or in the working illustration. So I mentioned it before, but these two graphs illustrate the speed advantages that flow sum offers over Spade and, and other similar algorithms. You can see it goes much, much, much faster uh, here uh, than Spade. This is from that first paper where it was uh, published. And then also here's a review paper that covered uh, flow sum and other um, similar analyses, and it uh, is definitely uh, among the fastest uh, running algorithms here. In Cytobank, this is our uh, titration of the speed running up to 90 million events, um, and it accomplishes that in uh, just over 200 minutes, uh, which is, uh, if you're familiar with uh, this, the speed of Spade in Cytobank is much, much, much faster than that. So how does FlowSum work? There's kind of four main steps. First, it reads in the data uh, into the algorithm. The second step builds the self-organizing map, uh, which is where it kind of knows where to put the different phenotypes once it has the clusters. After that, it builds a minimum spanning tree. This is similar to a uh, spade representation. Um, spade also uses a minimum spanning tree to display the results. And lastly is the meta-clustering step. So the first step in FlowSum is to select a starting population, and we're gonna look at this actually in just a second. Uh, and after that, select a sampling method if you need to. Uh, you don't necessarily need to downsample like I mentioned, but uh, if you want to just for speed reasons, um, you can absolutely do that. Next, you select the number of clustering channels you wanna use, and those follow very similar rules to our other algorithms if you've uh, already used those. Uh, if not, I'll cover uh, kind of the qualifications for what channels to include. Next up is you choose the self-organizing map settings. We select the cluster and meta-cluster number, and then also select how you want to display the output. Okay, so hopping into the software, here we have the result of a VISNY experiment. In Cytobank, we often recommend that people run VISNY first and then take the VISNY result and enter it into FlowSum uh, so you can compare the FlowSum results with the VISNY islands and see how they map. And I'll show you how that works. So the first, first step in FlowSum is really running VISNY. If you don't know how to do that, again, we have lots of tutorial uh, information online in our help desk and also on our YouTube page. Uh, so please feel free to, uh, to search for that information. Uh, we put a link in the, uh, in the comments uh, of this video uh, so you can find that easily. So after you have a VISNY result that you're happy with, um, you clone that VISNY experiment, you make it its own experiment in your inbox, and then you end up here. So in this FlowSum tutorial, we're going to be starting with this VISNY output. And the first step for the algorithm itself is to come up here under Advanced Analysis, and under FlowSum, click on New Analysis. You have to give it a name, and I'll call it that. And from here, we're greeted with the uh, the FlowSum setup page. Uh, the first thing we have to do is choose a starting population. I've manually gated in that VISNY experiment that I did, I manually gated several of the starting populations uh, and also final subpopulations. 
So you'll see all of these available here. For your own data, we'd recommend starting with a relatively clean population, um, something like singlets or scatter or CD45 positive. Um, however, you can gate down to any subpopulation you want to manually and start from there as well. Uh, in this case, I'm going to start from our scatter population. So I'll select scatter. And then next up, you have to choose which files and which events you'd like to include. Uh, so in this case, I'll click here to choose all three of these files. If you have one of the files as maybe a control or some FMOs you don't want to include in the actual analysis, you can just leave those files unchecked and they won't, uh, they won't appear in your FlowSum result. So in this case, you can see uh, the summary of how many events are in them, how many events are in the scatter gate, and then how many I'm including in my FlowSum analysis. So the next thing we have to choose is which clustering channels we'd like to use to compare all of our events. So I'll click on choose here. And so you can see here, there's a list of channels that have a V next to them. These are all of the channels I used in my Visney calculation. And I'm going to use those channels all again uh, for my flow sum calculation. I will not, however, use any of the scatter channels, the time channel, or my TSNE channels. So this follows the advice of all of our other algorithms as well. Um, it's great to use surface markers uh, for this kind of thing. You can also use functional markers if you have them as part of your panel. Um, just keep in mind um, how they'll affect the, uh, the result. Um, if something goes up or down in a functional marker channel, it will change um, basically where it sits on the tree uh, for that event. Uh, so again, uh, keep that in mind. But um, those are okay to include as well. Uh, however, linear scaled parameters, like in this case the scatter parameters, uh, should not be run at the same time as arcsine h scaled parameters, which is all the rest of these surface markers. Um, basically, they swamp the calculation and you'll only get clustering based on the linear markers, and that's not what we want here. Uh, you should also not include time. That's not a cell intrinsic characteristic at all. Uh, it's also linear, so it's definitely off the menu. Uh, and then TSD1 and 2, um, these are essentially uh, the condensed differences of all of these channels already. We're just going to have these along for the ride and use them to visualize the flow sum result uh, at the end. So again, we're not going to include these either. So now that I have all of these uh, surface markers selected, I'll click on Close, and you can see those listed there. The next option we have here is the event sampling. So basically choosing how many events we're going to include in our analysis. In this case, the default is equal sampling. So you can see it's taking an even number from each of these files. And I say select 50,000. There's not 50,000 in this smallest file. So we're just taking 35,000 from each. And that's OK in this, uh, in this scenario. Although, honestly, FlowSum is so fast that uh, there won't be much of a difference if we use all of our events either. So in this case, I'm just going to say use all events, and we'll make sure to take everything from all of our files. This next section is where it gets just a little bit more complicated. Um, this is essentially the settings we use to, to tweak the algorithm. So the first up is, uh, what do we want to use to create the self-organizing map? Do we want to make a new one for this data? Or do we want to use an existing self-organizing map for another run? Uh, and if you have other um, previous FlowSum runs that use the same panel that this one does, uh, you, can, you can select any of those. In this case, I have all of these runs um, that use the same panel, so I could use them. However, I'll create a new one just for this tutorial. The next step is the clustering method. So, by default, we use the hierarchical consensus clustering method, and this is what I'd recommend everybody use. It's a really robust one. It's good. However, if you have um, uh, the advice of a computational biologist or a bioinformatician, uh, or you're just curious to see what the difference is, uh, you can certainly use these other algorithm uh, clustering methods as well. Uh, but again, hierarchical consensus is a great default. The number of meta clusters is an option that you can select um, and generally, I change this to iterate on um, basically until I get my smallest population of interest in one meta cluster. Uh, so for this particular um, data, this is just PBMCs. Um, so there's not uh, 
I mean, it's stained with a lot of different markers, and there are kind of rare, rare subsets. But generally, I for this data, 15 meta clusters does a pretty good job of getting each subpopulation into its own uh, into its own meta cluster. Uh, however, please feel free to increase this or decrease this uh, as necessary. Uh, again, to to get your smallest population of interest in uh, its own meta cluster. The number of clusters is that kind of middle step. This is a Again, very analogous to uh, the target number of clusters in Spade, if you've used Spade before. Generally, I for, for data this complex, I like to, to stick um, with something a little higher. It's always better to overshoot the number of clusters and have them combined later on in a meta cluster than the opposite. If you go too low in the number of uh, traditional clusters, uh, essentially... Uh, you might be missing out on rare subpopulations. They'll, they'll essentially be invisible. So again, I normally skew a little bit higher for the number of clusters. And then iterations. Iterations controls the number of times the data is meta-clustered, and then the meta-cluster solution that occurs the most often is then selected as the meta-clustering method for the analysis. So 10 iterations is great. Um, the authors of the paper uh, have done more iterations and haven't seen that much of an increase in quality. Uh, so again, 10 is uh, a great default to start with. And then lastly, the seed. So if you leave this box blank, Cytobank will fill it with a random number. Um, if you'd like to reproduce the, this exact same flow sum analysis again, you use the same settings on the same data, and then you'd copy that seed number and enter it here. So by setting the seed to the same as a previous run with the same settings and the same data, you can get the exact same result. Um, this is beneficial if you are running uh, kind of a long-term analysis and you'd like to see how your new samples added into the analysis um, affect uh, the, the flow sum map. You can use the same seed and the same self-organizing map. You just reference that map you've already generated and then those new samples will be added into the existing map uh, and it'll have the same seed to begin with. So the next step up here, uh, we have transformations. Uh, normalizing the scales can be beneficial if you have vastly different um, brightnesses of your fluorophores. So if you have a very, very bright marker, something like BV421 or PE, and a very, very dim marker, um, but you have positive populations in both of them, by normalizing the scales, you can help essentially kind of lend weight to that dim positive uh, population or that population in the dim channel uh, and then um, have them be counted more equally. However, this can sometimes by normalizing negatively affect your outcome. So uh, if there's a question about it, I'd recommend running it both ways uh, just to see what kind of results you get. And uh, also compensation, it's very important to have uh, correctly compensated data if you have uh, fluorescent data or unmixed data, or panels built correctly, regardless of what kind of technology you're using. Uh, so again, um, clean data going in, it means a much better chance of a successful run uh, on the back end. And then lastly, we have the PDF output settings. So this is how you can choose how the results are displayed to you. So the first step, uh, we're going to choose which populations we want to see in our resulting pie charts. So I'll show you what these mean in just a second, but we'll go and click on Choose here. And I often like to include just the endpoint populations, things uh, that are not the intermediates. So in this case, you know, all of our uh, kind of final, like I said, uh, populations that I have manually gated. Um, if you haven't manually gated these beforehand, um, that's okay. Um, however, this is, at, you know, in this case, it's beneficial to look at these uh, endpoint populations. If, however, you're using FlowSum to display things, these pie charts display things like um, uh, exhaustion marker. Um, if, however, you're using these FlowSum results to display if, however, you're using these FlowSum pie charts to display things like exhaustion marker status or polyfunctional T-cell cytokines, uh, then ahead of time, before you kick off this analysis, you should have gated on the positive events for your exhaustion markers or the positive events for your cytokines, 
and then you can select those cytokine or exhaustion marker positive gates or populations here. And by doing that, it'll allow you to see um, which positive populations make up your pie charts uh, in the resulting figure. Uh, however, in this case, I'm just selecting these, uh, these endpoint populations. And then here under channels to plot, um, these are again basically showing you which ones you want to see your minimum spanning trees colored by. This is similar to uh, a spade result. Uh, in this case, I'm going to choose all of my surface markers, but um, I'm not really that interested in seeing how the rest of these look. So uh, we'll just leave, uh, leave it as all of our markers that we've used for VISNI and then also for uh, this flow sum analysis. Cluster sizing, you get to choose. If you want to see all of your clusters uh, relatively sized, that means the clusters that have few events will be small and the clusters that have many events will be large. Or you can set it to fixed. And again, you can choose how large you want the relative uh, max size to be or how large you want the fixed size to be. Um, it's up to you. Um, you have that option. Or you can do relative and fixed, and you can adjust each of those values independently. I normally just stick with relative, but again, uh, it's up to you what you'd like to choose. The output file type, uh, the default is PDFs. This is a great way to just communicate your results. However, if you're taking these figures and putting them on posters or in journal articles, PNGs will be much higher resolution. You also have the option to choose both types. Again, keep in mind though, if you include PNGs in any of it, uh, it greatly increases the file size. So in this case, we'll just stick with PDFs. And then lastly, you have the option to toggle the meta cluster background halo on in the plots. So you can choose it on just uh, the population pie charts, on all three, or on nothing if you want. This is a pretty good default, and I'll show you what this looks like again uh, once the results happen. So here we have um, our completed settings for our flow sum run. Once uh, you're ready to hit go, you can do that here. It's this big green button. You can click Run Flow Sum Analysis. And once you do hit that button, it's off to the races. The analysis goes uh, from your browser to our server, and then the server runs those calculations. So now you can shut down your browser if you want to, you can turn off your computer, go home, um, whatever you'd like, and the analysis will still complete. When it does complete, it'll send you an email to say, hey, uh, your flow sum run is done. And from there, you can click on a link and hop right back in and see your results. Um, while that's uh, nice, um, what happens if you're curious? We just looked at a lot of settings. Um, if you want to change any of these settings, you can come up here and click on Copy Settings. And what that does is it sets up a new flow sum run with the same name, except for a copy in parentheses afterwards. And then it allows you to change any of the settings that you might be interested in. Like next time, I could say Copy Settings and change my number of meta clusters to 20 or 25 or 4 if I wanted to and see what difference that makes in my results. By default, you can run multiple flow sum analyses at once. It depends on what kind of server you're using, but you can run at least two at once, up to four at once. And again, those will run concurrently, and when they're finished, you'll get, uh, you'll get those emails that they're done. So in this case, we're not going to wait much longer for this to complete. Uh, we're going to pull a cooking show trick, and while we put this one into the oven, we're going to take a completed analysis out of the oven uh, and, uh, and take a look at what that looks like. So here, we're going to click on the flow sum tutorial. This is one of my completed analyses already, and we can see what that looks like. So there's two kind of components to a completed flow sum analysis. One is the run information and the plots, and this is what we'll take a look at first. The other is the created experiment. And the flow sum experiment has all of the FCS files that you originally started with, all the same gates and scales, etc. Um, but it it has two added channels into each of the FCS files, one for which cluster an event belongs to, and the other is for which meta cluster the event belongs to. So like I said, we'll take a look at both of these in a moment, uh, but first we'll hop into uh, the PowerPoint again to talk a little bit about what we expect to see. So uh, again, there's the output files that you can download, and then also the new experiment. So the output files are uh, essentially very similar to what a spade tree will look like. It takes 
each of the channels that you selected in that second list that we that we were just talking about and colors your nodes by the expression level that node has in whatever channel it's displaying. So here you can see what CD8 looks like, uh, the expression levels of CD4, CD20, or NF Kappa B. Um, you can see again uh, across all of your different populations what their expression levels are in these channels. The next kind of visualization that it gives you is this pie chart, um, the pie chart minimum spanning tree. And it colors the pie charts by what population um, they're, uh, they're gated as. So here you can see up here, these are all of the CD4 positive uh, RA negative memory T cells. The red ones down here are just the events in the live cell gate that don't fit into anything else. The blue ones are the CD3. The dark blue over here are the B cells. So you can see what essentially portions of these clusters fall into these manual gates. And this is where you can also see uh, if you are gating on um, polyfunctional T cell cytokines or exhaustion markers, where you could see what proportion of each of these clusters falls into each of those gates as well. So again, something to, uh, to keep in mind if you're looking for applications for this. Uh, and then you can see around these nodes, these other colors, and these are the meta cluster colors. So you can see that little key right here. You can see which of these nodes belongs to which meta cluster. Again, CD4, CD8, B cells, and monocytes. And another version of this is that same minimum spanning tree layout. However, it's each of these nodes turned into a little star chart where you can see the proportion of the events that make up each of these clusters colored by their phenotype. And if you zoom in, you can see uh, it's a little bit clearer. You can do that in a PDF. Uh, you can see, uh, again, the proportion of each of these nodes uh, as being CD4 or CD3 positive. And over here, these are the CD8 and the CD3 positive. So let's hop back into the software and, uh, and take a look at these, uh, actually, uh, how they're appearing. So we'll download these and open it up. And we can see now it'll be in the results folder. Uh, here's some run info from the R script and some supporting files for the R script. Uh, you'll be interested in what's in the results folder. And uh, first off, there's a lot of spreadsheets. These give you um, all of the statistics for each node uh, for all of your channels or for all of your samples. There's a lot of different ways to split that apart. We won't go over everything here, but if you're curious in the very high resolution um, very granular data to see numbers from each of your nodes, that's where you can find it. One of the first things I look at is the legend. When you open up the legend, you can see uh, essentially your tree structure laid out, uh, and then up at the top is what is being displayed. In this case, each of these numbers is a meta cluster ID, and you can see they're being um, sized by how many events they contain, it's relative size. Here's that same one with a fixed size, just so you can get an idea of the layout a little bit cleaner. And then here's those same um, nodes organized in a grid. Um, if you were curious about which uh, meta clusters they're in, you can look at this grid. If you're curious about which cluster they're in, you can look at this grid down at the bottom. It'll show you, you know, one through 15, and then all the way on up. In this case, I have 225 clusters, so we're seeing all 225. If you use fewer clusters, you'll have obviously fewer nodes in this figure. So this gives you an idea of just where each cluster individually and which meta clusters uh, these, these nodes are part of. So from there, we can hop into any of these other um, PDFs. Uh, in this case, uh, population pie chart. This is one that's very similar to uh, the one I was just showing you. This is with my um, kind of manually gated populations, just these endpoint populations. Um, for everything aggregated, so all of my samples kind of dumped into one, but also then each sample independently. And this is another big benefit of running FlowSum and Cytobank is you can start with all of your samples in your experiment, choose which ones go into the analysis, and then see them split apart on the back end of the analysis automatically. You don't have to concatenate anything or unconcatenate anything to see um, the individual file resolution in these results. 
So again, you can see across everything, either by um, individual file or by aggregated events. Here's all the fixed size. Here's all the relative size um, nodes. So again, lots of different ways to kind of slice and dice this data to get an idea of what's going on across all these populations. And you can see the meta clusters uh, arranged here, uh, again, by these different kind of halo colors around these nodes. So that's the population um, pie charts. There's also the star plots here. Um, in this case, especially when they cl cluster really closely together, there's a lot of these individual clusters uh, grouped very closely. It can be a little bit difficult to make them out. Um, that's where these kind of larger star plots can come in handy. However, in this case, there's too many channels we're looking at to get a, a really clear view of what these look like. And then lastly, we can see the meta cluster comparisons. We can see uh, how hierarchical consensus happened, uh, which is, again, the one that we used in this analysis. But if you're curious about how any of the other clustering methods would have worked, you can click and see how k-means or how hierarchical without the consensus portion would have meta-clustered your data. So here, again, that's our, our PDFs that we've looked at. We also have in these more of these spreadsheets. So again, feel free to dive in and look at that very granular data. Um, but this is the flow sum output uh, portion of the results. There's the other portion that I mentioned, that's the created experiment. And this is where uh, kind of the strength of using this algorithm uh, in combination with uh, Visni previously, or you can take these clusters and put them into other algorithms kind of down the line. Uh, this is where it really becomes um, uh, tangible. So if we want to see this, we can click on this view created experiment link. And it brings us to, again, that new experiment with those two new channels added, the cluster and meta cluster channel. If you have um, a TSNE channels in your experiment, when you put it into FlowSOM, uh, FlowSOM will generate a uh, figure for you automatically, uh, like I'm about to show you. So again, I mentioned there's these two new channels. Uh, there's the TSNE channels that have tagged along from our first experiment we used to set this one up. But there's also the FlowSOM cluster ID and meta cluster ID channels. And if you want, you can take a look at those in the gating page. Here in the gating page, you can see um, your TSNE channels, like you could beforehand, all of your manual gates, because they tag along as well. But you can also see uh, Cytobank has auto-gated all of the meta cluster information for you. Uh, so now you can view each meta cluster population by population. So if we wanted to see where, for instance, meta cluster 10 was, we can see here, this is just a handful of events. Let's look for meta cluster number one. Uh, it's this population right here. So you can go through one by one if you want um, on this auto-gated um, meta cluster inf information. Uh, but you can also use a new feature inside a bank, these automatic cluster gates, to do individual clusters. So instead of doing it on the meta cluster channel, you can do that on the cluster channel instead. So if we do cluster versus cluster, you can see I've already put in a few of these, but we can put in a few more. And the way it works is by clicking on that automatic cluster gates and then selecting which channel you'd like to automatically gate on. Um, this works best with channels arrayed uh, that are integers, so things like cluster or meta cluster. Um, however, uh, feel free to experiment. Um, in this case, however, we'll be using cluster ID. Uh, and the gate name prefix, it'll be cluster underscore uh, whatever we want. You can change it uh, if you'd rather to make it uh, something like flowsom cluster underscore. You know, it's up to you what you want to call it, but this is what the, the gate name prefix will be. And then you choose uh, essentially which integers you want to include inside of your gates. So you can enter in a comma separated list, uh, just one, two, three. Uh, you can say, for instance, five colon ten and that will gate everything between 5 and 10 individually. Um, if you do things uh, in parentheses, it'll include them in the same gate. So parentheses 20 colon 40 parentheses will include everything in the same gate. So you can, if you have clusters uh, that are uh, you know, way too many clusters, you can identify which populations they're part of and choose to include them in the same gate if you want to, kind of automatically um, kind of pseudo concatenate them, if you will. Uh, so in this case, you can see I've already gated four of these 
manually, I can do this a handful more. Let's see, I might do 20 and 40 and uh, 140. And then let's call it uh, 160 through 165. I can say apply changes. It'll automatically gate those populations for me. And then I have to refresh this page. So I refresh the whole browser page and then those gates will be available for me in the gating interface. So now we have all my manual gates like before, my meta cluster gates that Flowsum did automatically, my previous ones that you saw, and then my new gates that I've just drawn. And you can see that uh, listed here. And now these act just like populations. So we can visualize them either here in the gating page or back out in the working illustration. So now that I've added a whole bunch of new gates, I want to make sure to apply and return to go back to the working illustration. So what do you do now that you have maybe some interesting automatically generated FlowSOM meta clusters? Um, how, do you, how do you show this off? Um, so one of the first things I like to do is to basically give people an idea of where all of my populations are. And I uh, like to do this on the two Visney parameters, TSNE1 and TSNE2. So to set up this figure, you can mirror these settings. You select all of your Visney or your FlowSOM channels that you used. So I have all of those selected in my channels column. I have scattered, you know, basically all of my events selected in my populations. Then I have all of my FCS files selected, these three PBMC files selected. And then to show it in this manner, uh, it's a dot plot color by channel, and then I change the coloring channel to panel channel values. And that basically goes through and iterates one by one everything I have selected in this channels list. And so now for my first file, sample number one, or donor one, I can see which events are bright or high for CD25, 57, CD27, CD95, you know, so on. You can see which islands in this case are monocytes or NK cells, um, basically just down the line uh, across all of your surface markers. So this is a great way to, uh, as like a kind of a supplementary figure, to show everyone how all of your populations are mapped out on the Visney parameters. So from here, um, the next essentially way you can do this is to display your flow sum meta clusters on those same Visney coordinates. So in this case, I'm going to change the plot type from dot plot color by channel to dot plot color by overlaid figure dimension. I'm going to choose all of our meta clusters. And there's a kind of a short way you can do that. Uh, if you search by meta and then select all, you get all of your meta clusters. If you want to reorganize them, uh, you certainly can. I'm not going to take the time to do it uh, entirely here, but you can use these little uh, handles to reorganize your meta clusters. You can put them in a row if you want to. Um, and once I have uh, all of those selected, and I'll turn off my scatter, I'll click done. Now I'm going to come over here to channels, and um, you know, actually, I am just going to turn, I'm going to turn channels off, and move FCS files here. So when I change plot type to overlay figure dimension, that overlays each of these populations because they're in the second position. So you want to make sure your populations are here in the second position. And we have our three FCS files. Um, so now um, when we click update, we'll get each of our meta clusters overlaid on top of our TSNE parameters. So we can see how Visney has separated our populations compared to how FlowSOM separates our populations. And it can make for uh, a kind of a nice visualization on how this algorithm has gone about um, kind of identifying uh, these subpopulations. So here we can see each of our meta clusters overlaid and uh, we can get a good idea of kind of where these populations are. So in this case, you can see this donor is missing some of these populations that these other two uh, samples have. Um, and that's, you know, kind of an interesting difference. So if you're curious about what those are, it looks like it's the red and maybe uh, the maroon or brown. Um, we can see that up here. It looks like it's maybe meta cluster four and meta cluster three. Let's keep our eyes on those two. So this is, again, the summary of 
um, the flow sum meta clusters overlaid on the two Visney parameters. So this is kind of the second figure I would show when I was trying to show people you know, where all these different subpopulations are. And we can either you know, map back to that first figure I talked about, uh, where you could see the different e expression levels across all the different islands. But there's uh, kind of a, an even better kind of summary figure that I like to show. Uh, and that is uh, kind of a, a fingerprint of each of these flow sum meta clusters. So uh, you can change the plot type to heat map. And then uh, from heat map, I'm going to change the x axis to use panel channel values. And I'm going to turn channels back on. And now I'm going to rearrange these a little bit. So it lays everything out by FCS file. And now I'm going to have each of my channels versus each of my flow sum meta clusters. And it'll give me this nice fingerprint uh, of heat map expression levels for each of my meta clusters. So we can determine uh, kind of what's going on in them. So I'll click now update to get this heat map. And sometimes it requires a little optimization. Uh, on occasion, some of these meta clusters have signals that are very, very high. Um, if I didn't quite gate out all the debris and FlowSum decided to stick the debris into um, one particular meta cluster, maybe it's an antibody aggregate, um, then that can kind of wash out my, um, my heat map. And we kind of see that here. It looks like meta cluster 10 is very, very bright uh, for CD8. But it doesn't look like there's a lot of events there. Um, if you mouse over it, you can kind of see how many events are around. Um, we might uh, just, you know, in, for uh, purposes of display, uh, we might actually remove meta cluster 10. Uh, and same with meta cluster 16, there's not really that many events there. We could go back and double check to see kind of what those are. Uh, but we can hop in here and click on choose and remove 10 and also remove 16. And I'll click update. So you can see that's uh, basically a nice summary of uh, everything that uh, that's going on um, for uh, for meta cluster one. Um, you could do the same for each of these other meta clusters and uh, and get a good idea of kind of what uh, what kind of cells each meta cluster contains. So this is a uh, a great summary figure to basically um, uh, take a quick look at uh, what FlowSOM has done in splitting your populations apart. So those three figures combined can provide uh, a nice overview uh, with reference, you know, so you can see kind of where those cells are uh, of, of everything in your tubes. And you can go on from there. So if you'd like to uh, then get your hands on any events in these meta clusters in their own FCS files, you can come up here to Actions, and after you've selected only the meta clusters that you uh, that you want, um, and then click Update on your illustration, you can come up here to Actions and click Split Files by Population. That'll give you a new experiment with just the events from that meta cluster in their own FCS file. So that gives you kind of a good way to kind of track down um, and get your hands on just an individual subset of uh, of those events. So that's a quick overview of uh, how to set up a FlowSOM and how to take one look at the FlowSOM results. Let's look back um, here uh, and just talk about some highlights real quick. So that new FlowSOM experiment will be generated um, in addition to those PDFs after, uh, after a FlowSOM is run. And you can use FlowSOM as part of a pipeline. And I talked about this um, you know, over the course of this video. We took our raw data and we gated on a, a kind of a clean starting population. We ran Visney first. We took the output from Visney, ran FlowSum on that. We looked at it as part of a heat map or uh, kind of overlaid uh, meta cluster populations. And by combining those things, uh, that's uh, in essence uh, an analysis pipeline. So like I showed you before, there's a way to take those FlowSum figures, overlay them on the Visney coordinates, and then generate a, a heat map based on their expression levels to see kind of where, uh, you know, uh, what kind of cells these are. If you'd like to see flow sum in the literature, um, we have uh, a couple examples. This is, again, a paper where they're taking flow sum clusters, overlaying them back on TSNE coordinates. Uh, and this paper down here is um, essentially the one that um, uh, took a look at a lot of different uh, high dimensional analysis tools 
and then uh, recommended FlowSum as being uh, among the best. So why should you use FlowSum um, as opposed to another algorithm or a Spade uh, in particular? Um, FlowSum, again, clusters uh, and then also has a meta clustering step. Uh, and you should use it when you need a quick and consistent clustering method. Uh, so if you want to see all of your populations as clusters, if you want to have a map which you can then map new samples back onto that has the same structure as the original map, or if you need something that happens uh, relatively quickly, it's a great tool for that. Uh, however, keep in mind, there's kind of these two ways to visualize it. Um, one is in uh, a new experiment looking at the Visni coordinates. The other is those PDFs that are generated, but it's a qualitative comparison. There's no statistics that inherently happen inside of the FlowSum algorithm. Um, if you want statistics from a FlowSum result, you can always take those meta clusters, draw gates around them, or uh, export them to a new experiment, and then export statistics that way. Uh, but uh, it's unlike Citrus, where there's no statistical inference um, that, that happens as part of the algorithm itself. So uh, in summary, that was a, kind of a whirlwind of a flow sum. Cytobank in general supports uh, this high dimensional single cell analysis, allows you to look at both bulk or single cell data with that drop uh, feature that I mentioned earlier on, uh, and basically fosters uh, collaboration between people in groups in between labs, between um, institutions across continents. It's very easy to collaborate when uh, everything is all on the same server. So uh, if you're interested in trying out Cytobank, uh, you're just uh, hopping in to see this for the first time, please visit premium.cytobank.org for a free 30-day trial. And we're happy to, uh, to extend that so you can have the chance to try it out in your own data and uh, take a look at it. With that, uh, thank you for your time, and uh, please feel free to visit support.cytobank.org if you have any questions about getting started or any questions about the analysis results, we're happy to help out.